Welcome, this is John. I wish to take a moment to thank the onslaught of subscribers who are going to allow my videos to be a part of your life. An amazing quantity of hits to subscribe in just the last two weeks. What a surprise. I thank you one and all. Now, on to today's video subject. I don't remember how, but a few weeks ago, I stumbled on this guy's name, so I decided to do some research. I was in total awe. He was born Joseph Francis Keaton, October 4th, 1895. At the age of three, he began performing with his parents. Not long after, he was known as the Great Stoneface. Keaton was born into a vaudeville family in Peakway, Kansas. His mother, Myra, and father, Joseph Keaton. He was named Joseph to continue a tradition on his father's side. He was six in line, bearing the name Joseph. He first appeared on stage in 1899 in Wilmington, Delaware. The act was mainly a comedy sketch. Myra played the saxophone to one side while Joe and Keaton performed center stage. The young Keaton goaded his father by disobeying him and the elder Keaton responded by throwing him against the scenery into the orchestra pit or even into the audience. A suitcase handle was sewn into Keaton's clothing to aid with the constant tossing. The act evolved as Keaton learned to take trick falls safely. He was rarely injured or bruised on stage. And I emphasize stage because that isn't how it was later in his films. Keeping in mind he was only three, accusations of child abuse and occasionally arrests. However, Keaton was always able to show the authorities that he had no bruises or broken bones. He was eventually billed as the little boy who can't be damaged. <laughs> Keaton said that he was never hurt by his father and that the falls and physical comedy were a matter of proper technical execution. The secret is in landing limp and breaking the fall with a foot or a hand. It's a knack. The act ran up against laws banning child performers in vaudeville. Keaton was made to go to school while performing in New York, but only attended for part of one day. He stated that he learned to read and write late and was taught by his mother. By the time he was 21, his father's alcoholism threatened the reputation of the family's act. So Keaton and his mother, Myra, left for New York, where Keaton's career quickly moved from vaudeville to film. According to Keaton, he was given the nickname Buster by family friend Harry Houdini, who was touring with the Keatons at the time. When Keaton accidentally fell down a flight of stairs when he was about six months old and without injury. I was six months old, we were in some little town small hotel and I fell down a full flight of stairs at the back to the bottom they come running up I sat up and just shook shook my head and shook it off and didn't cry so they knew I wasn't hurt and Houdini says that was sure a buster meaning a fall because that's the only time it was used it meant a Bronco buster or a fall it was never used as a name my father said, well, that would be a good name for him. It don't sound bad. And for the record, Michael or Diane Keaton are not related to Buster Keaton. Keaton made dozens of short films and 14 major silent features, attesting to one of the most talented and innovative artists of his time. Six of those films are in the National Film Registry, making him the most honored filmmaker. The title of those films, One Week in 1920, Cops in 1922, Sherlock Jr. in 1924, The General in 1926, Steamboat Bill Jr. in 1928, and finally, The Cameraman in 1928. 
And out of those, Keaton said he was most proud of his film, The General, because he took something right out of the history books. The General, a 1926 American silent film released by United Artists, it was inspired by the Great Locomotive Chase, a true story of an event that occurred during the American Civil War. The story was adapted from the 1889 memoir, The Great Locomotive. In 1952, Chaplin and Buster Keaton shared the screen for the first time in a film called Limelight. Limelight will be the most remembered in the public consciousness as the sole screen collaboration of Chaplin and his parallel silent comic star Buster Keaton. However, Limelight was heavily boycotted in the United States because of Charlie Chaplin's alleged communist sympathies and the film failed commercially. Going back a few years, meeting Arbuckle would probably be his break into films. In February of 1917, he met Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle at the Talmadge Studios in New York City, where Arbuckle was under contract to Joseph M. Shinnock. During his first meeting with Arbuckle, Keaton was such a natural in his first film, The Butcher Boy, he was hired on the spot. He appeared in a total of 14 Arbuckle shorts, running into 1920. Keaton and Arbuckle became close friends, and Keaton was one of the few people, along with Charlie Chaplin, to defend Arbuckle's character during accusations that he was responsible for the death of actress Virginia Rape. In all the stunts, he never broke a single bone, although a finger had to be partially amputated, nearly lost part of his sight, and was sucked out of his bedroom window by a tornado. Yes, according to legend, one day while his parents were performing in Kansas shortly before Buster's third birthday, Buster suffered three alarming accidents. First, he caught his hand in a clothes ringer, mangling the tip of his right index finger, which had to be amputated. Later, the same day, he hit himself near the right eye with a rock while trying to knock a peach out of a tree. Still later, he was sucked out of a window by a tornado, carried three blocks, and deposited on the ground unhurt, concluding that Buster might be safer on stage. Keaton had another injury. During his time in uniform, he developed an ear infection that permanently impaired his hearing. Keaton had yet another injury where he fractured his ankle in the film he worked on before the Playhouse. So the Playhouse relied more on cinematic techniques and sight gags rather than stunt work. It's believed he seriously injured himself falling down two stories after stepping out of a bathroom in the film one week. Both his arms and back swelled as well after filming. At this point, he was roughly 25 years of age. In 1924, the film Sherlock Jr., Keaton was in a stunt on top of a train, then jumping onto a water tower spout when the huge force of water came down on him. It fractured his neck. He didn't even know it for several years. Having migraine headaches, a doctor finally diagnosed it. Buster Keaton's most famous rule was never to fake a gag as he believed in convincing the audience by actually performing the stunts without any cuts. And he believed stuntmen aren't funny. As in this one from Steamboat Bill Jr., the gags of all gags, a two-story, two-ton wall falling over him. This was a closely precision stunt that could have crushed him. He had only two inches on any side of him, fully fortifying Keaton's motto, never fake a gag. However, all that ended in 1928 upon signing the contract with MGM. He was no longer allowed to do his own stunts. Following three features under Keaton's control, 
they fell short of financial expectations at the box office. In 1928, film executive Nicholas Shinnock arranged a deal with Metro-Golden-Mayer for Keaton's services. Keaton had little to say about the details of the MGM contract. He would no longer have any financial responsibility for his films, and even his salary had been pre-negotiated. Without his input, Charlie Chaplin and Harold Lloyd advised him against making the move, cautioning that he would lose his independence. But given Shinnock's desire to keep things in the family, and Keaton having to admit that his independent pictures hadn't done well, Keaton agreed to sign with MGM. He would later cite this as the worst business decision of his life. Keaton had married three times in his life. His first marriage was quite possibly his worst personal decision of his life. But first, I'd like to talk about the homes he lived in. I could not confirm where his first home was pre-1923, when he married actress Natalie Talmadge, May 31, 1921, second of the three Talmadge sisters and sister-in-law to Joseph Schenick. In 1923, Keaton secretly bought a lot in Los Angeles. It would be his second home at 543 South Muirfield Road, Hancock Park, Los Angeles, a 1923 Italian revival estate. He constructed a mission-style mansion and furnished it as a surprise for Natalie. He thought she would be wild with excitement. As always, she disappointed him. When he showed her the house for the first time, she dismissed it out of hand as being much too small. It had no servants' quarters. Heartbroken, Keaton sold the house to Bernice Mannix, the wife of MGM Vice President Eddie Mannix, who loved the home. In December of 1924, Keaton purchased a three and one half acre property with an entrance on Hartford Way. Today's address is 1018 Palmella Way. It was 10,000 square feet, it had 20 rooms, he paid $300,000. He was 29 when he purchased the lot, 30 when the home finished construction in 1926. During the first three years of marriage, Natalie bore two sons, Joseph and Robert. Then, at the urging of and backed by her iron-willed mother, Peg, and her movie sisters, Norma and Constance, Natalie refused Keaton any further conjugal rights and insisted on separate bedrooms. Keaton, in turn, informed his wife that he would accept her decision, but would have affairs outside of the marriage. He kept his word. Natalie had him followed by private detectives. In my view, a move by these four that would win a sweepstakes divorce. Natalie Talmadge Keaton was driven by three needs to keep up with and even surpass her more famous sisters to meet what she considered the public's expectations of her as a fashion icon. To be photographed in the same outfit twice was inconceivable, and to exhibit the lifestyle she thought a Hollywood star and his wife deserved. Natalie reportedly spent $900 per week on clothes, and she pushed Keaton to buy or lease even larger and more expensive homes in fashionable Los Angeles neighborhoods like Hancock Park to better reflect his and her exalted status. Oh man. Although forgotten now, Jean Verge is listed as the architect of this famous Italian villa, but it was Keaton who planned large parts of the house and grounds. The details of this mansion home is extensive, which I'll save for another video. Natalie and Keaton were married for 11 years. They dated for one year after getting together in May of 1919. After four months engagement, they married on the 31st of May 1921. They divorced on the 25th of July 1932. Their first son, Joseph, later name changed to James, lived till he was 101 and Robert lived till the age of 99. 
but Natalie continued to spend as extravagantly as ever. Keaton began drinking heavily. In 1932, Natalie divorced Keaton in a bitter and widely publicized court case. She took his entire fortune. She took the Italian villa and she took their sons and legally changed her eldest son's name to James Talmud. She refused to allow Keaton to see them for the next nine years. Actions, I am sure, her soul is still paying back to this day. At the same time, MGM fired him. By the mid-1930s, Keaton was silver and working again, as usual, uncredited. As a coach, writer, and gag man for the Marx Brothers, Red Skelton, Gene Kelly, Frank Sinatra, and advice to Lucille Ball and others. Natalie died June 19, 1969 in Santa Monica, California, age 73. But this is about Buster Keaton. Despite numerous attempts by reporters, biographers, and others to turn his life into a tragedy, Keaton never saw it that way. He said, I think I have had the happiest and luckiest of lives. Maybe this is because I never expected as much as I got, and when the knocks came, I felt it was no surprise. Keaton's fourth house at 1043 South Victoria, a four-room, three-bath, and with 1,800 square foot, today sells roughly for $1.6 million. His second marriage to May Scriven was during what he called an alcoholic blackout, so we can just leave it at that. His fifth house at 22612 Sylvan Street, Woodland Hills, California, was bought in June of 1956 for $50,000. He lived there with his third wife, Eleanor Norris. The house was originally built in 1947. The house at that address today is not the same house. In fact, over the decades, the house's former one and a half acres had been pared down to 0.83 acres. The one-story house was bought with the $50,000 given to Buster by Paramount for the screen rights to his life story, starring Donald O'Connor. Eleanor recalled attending a preview with Buster and how they felt like crawling out on their hands and knees, stating, frankly, it was terrible. His marriage to Eleanor was a very happy marriage. She always seemed to be happy to talk about Buster and his career. Norris became acquainted with Buster Keaton in 1938 when she was looking to improve her bridge game. Keaton was known as one of the best bridge players in Hollywood. A friend introduced her to the game at Keaton's house. She sat at Keaton's bridge game a few nights a week for over a year without interacting with her host. One time, however, she snapped back at another player who made a nasty remark about a card she had played. And Keaton raised his eyes and noticed her. They dated for about a year before he proposed marriage. And on May 29, 1940, Keaton married Eleanor Norris, who was 23 years his junior. With his independent filmmaking career taken from him, two failed marriages, most of his money gone, and a history of alcoholism, Keaton, 42 years old, when they met in 1938, was quite the opposite of the pretty and popular Eleanor, then age 19. Keaton was working at MGM as a gag writer, producing comedy routines at a salary of 200 a week. He spent his free time playing cards with friends. At first glance, he seemed old and sad and forbidding. Norris discovered that he was kind, gentle, and patient. John Tibbetts, an American film critic, historian, and author, noted in his interview with her that she possessed the kind of sturdy independence, inner reserve, and genuine caring nature that must have appealed to Buster. There is a small mural in Cottage Grove, Oregon, where most of the general was filmed in the summer of 1926. I was disappointed to find Keaton's hometown of Pickway has nearly nothing to commemorate him, 
but a small room behind a store, and nothing else. This sort of ticked me off, until I noticed Hollywood has even less, and that is shameful. I hope my recognition here shows my appreciation of his hard work. They were both invited to perform in Paris in 1947. The act, his first vaudeville performance in 30 years. The act was well received and well paying. Keaton received $1,500 per performance. They spent about six months a year performing in Europe in the 1950s. They also performed together on The Buster Keaton Show in early 1950, Once Upon a Mattress on April 3rd, 1957. They appeared on the reality television documentary show, This Is Your Life. She helped arrange the appearance of Buster's sister, brother, sons, and notable contemporaries. This, combined with all the commercials he did, helped furnish the house and make a good living for them both. Keaton died of lung cancer on February 1st, 1966, at age 70, in Woodland Hills, Los Angeles. Despite being diagnosed with cancer in January of 1966, he was never told he was terminally ill. Keaton thought he was just recovering from a severe case of bronchitis. Confined to a hospital, during his final days, Keaton was restless and paced the room endlessly, desiring to return home. Keaton was up out of bed and moving around and even played cards with friends who came to visit the day before he died. After his death in 1966, Eleanor helped ensure Keaton's legacy by giving many interviews to biographers, film historians, and journalists sharing details from his personal life and career, and also attended film festivals and celebrations honoring Keaton. Eleanor Ruth Norris was born July 29, 1918 in Hollywood, California. She was a dancer and variety show performer. She was married to Buster Keaton for 26 years from 1940 until his death in 1966. Eleanor was hospitalized at the Motion Picture Relief Fund Hospital in Woodland Hills, suffering from emphysema and lung cancer. She died on October 19, 1998, at age 80. Her remains were cremated. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I enjoyed making it and learning about Buster Keaton myself, as well as renewing his head marker to extend its life for those who will one day learn about Buster Keaton, as I did, maybe visit his site. Please subscribe, click the bell to receive notice of future videos from me, and thank you for watching. And I'll see you in the next one. On Lillian Way in Hollywood, at the exact site of the old Buster Keaton Studios, Crest will have installed a bronze medallion to mark that spot for all time to come in your honor.